Yeah, I'm Shubro. I'm joining you from uh, California, United States. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to make it uh, to Berlin this time. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, you find my content helpful uh, in your endeavors uh, for building search indexing pipelines. So yeah, welcome to my talk today on architecting search indexing pipelines in Google Cloud Platform. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm Shubro. I'm an uh, engineering manager for search infrastructure at Box. Uh, I've been a staff engineer on the information retrieval side for some time. And before that, I was at Oracle, uh, again, working on full text search at the database. So that's been my domain. And I've spoken at various conferences around availability, distributed systems, and solar. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about search indexing pipelines um, specifically for solar and how to build them in a uh, public cloud. Uh, so a little bit about box search uh, for those that uh, have not used box as a application. It's basically a cloud content management platform that enables users, uh, enterprise users uh, to collaborate on content, uh, which is extremely uh, needed in this hybrid work environment that we are in today. Uh, at the center of this uh, content uh, cloud is uh, content discovery, which is powered by Box Search. Uh, at its core, it's basically running um, a highly distributed version of Solar, but we also use other technologies like Kafka, Spark, uh, HBase, Zookeeper, and Offlate, a uh, few technologies in uh, Google Cloud Platform that we will be discussing about today. Uh, this infrastructure is powering search for millions of users across uh, hundreds of thousands of enterprises. Uh, some of the largest customers have over 400,000 users. Um, and the entire infrastructure operates at um, very high availability of three nines. Uh, we uh, our index has over 100 billion docs, uh, which um, eventually uh, turns out to be more than 200 terabytes of solar index, and this is unreplicated. So with replication, I think it's close to a petabyte. And uh, this index is growing pretty fast. It grows almost uh, it doubles every year, uh, and we are and like the indexing pipeline specifically sees more than 10,000 updates per second. So. That is why it is critical for our system uh, to be able to support this kind of a scale. And uh, some of the scale requirements of our uh, indexing infrastructure comes from there. So today uh, I'll talk about uh, search indexing for box search uh, at a high level, some of the pain points of uh, the existing infrastructure and why we chose to move to the public cloud. Uh, then I'll go into the actual GCP architecture to see how the new indexing pipeline looks like. Uh, spend some time talking about how to perform a migration from on-prem throw down time to customers. And finally, some outcomes of actually doing this migration to see what the benefits were. But before we dive into this topic, why are we even talking about indexing pipelines? Uh, the reason is that indexing latency is critical to certain kinds of applications of search like box where users are constantly modifying the content and uh, it's highly important for them to be able to discover their latest updates. Uh, if there is any document that is lost in the indexing pipeline or if there is a high latency, then even though search may be available, it leads to a very bad user experience. So in this case, uh, it, it almost seems like search indexes are similar to sushi. It's best served fresh. Um, and uh, there are some use cases of search, like if you're uh, searching product catalogs, maybe uh, it is not so important to have very uh, low indexing latency because you can update the catalog daily. Uh, but in other use cases like Box, um, it's really important that you are able to scale your indexing pipeline to maintain very low latency and high availability. So this is what the search indexing looks like for Box. When users perform actions on the Box application, say upload a file or edit some content or collaborate a new user, uh, these actions translate to updates in the application database and uh, the backend storage system. I won't go into details of uh, the storage system. It's, it's not like a single database. It's, it's a whole infrastructure, and probably it's a separate talk, talk about it. But um, the AppDB here represents the storage infrastructure. 
any changes in this uh, database are then captured in a Kafka topic uh, called CDC or change data capture. So these changes are then accessible for any application that wants to consume of the stream. Uh, search worker is the search consumer that reads from this Kafka stream to get all the item IDs that are being updated by the users. Once an item is updated, uh, the search worker will then request a representation of that document. What, what I mean by representation is uh, various documents such as PDFs, DocX, et cetera, have different formats. So we are running Apache Tika to convert uh, the various document formats into indexable search content. There are also other document types like images and videos, uh, which need to be augmented further either through image recognition or uh, text to speech, uh, speech to text. Um, so those kind of things happen in the search representation service, uh, which then converts the document into indexable format. The search worker also gathers additional information about the document, such as uh, users that are collaborated on the document, uh, and then constructs what we call the solar document. The solar document is then indexed to all the replica shards uh, that are active for solar. Uh, and in addition, it also indexes or stores the solar document in an offline store. Now, the reason for having an offline store is that we should be able to rebuild the solar index from scratch. There are various reasons that you may need to do this. One common reason is if there is a um, significant schema change for solar, which causes uh, it to be not backwards compatible, you need to rebuild the index. Uh, sometimes you may want to uh, create a new cluster, for example, to run relevance experiments. Uh, other times you may have somehow corrupted your solar index and again requiring to build uh, the index from scratch. Now, this can be a pretty expensive operation and mean a lot of load on the downstream systems like uh, the application database and representation system if you don't have the offline store. So that is the reason why we also keep a copy of the document in the offline store. Uh, the existing infrastructure uses HBase as the offline store, where it stores uh, the document keyed by the rotated document ID. Uh, the key is rotated to avoid hotspotting of monotonically increasing uh, keys. It stores the solar document XML and other information about the document, such as the sharding key, uh, which tells us which shard to index the document to in solar. This data is stored in HBase in a sorted row key format. And to rebuild, we run a MapReduce job against the document table. The mapper tasks basically uh, distributedly scan the document table and then construct batches for each shard, and the batch writer writes them to solar. The batch writer internally also takes care of retrying uh, failures with exponential backoff. And if it fails to recover, then it writes the rows to a dead letter queue. It is really important for us to ensure that we do not miss any documents when we are running this rebuild job. And that is why we need to have a dead letter queue because if some documents or updates are left behind, then those documents will be unsearchable by the users till someone else updates the same document. The job itself is pretty long running. So each map task keeps a checkpoint every n rows. And this ensures that if a map task were to fail or if the entire job were to fail, we can resume from the last saved checkpoint and thereby update, uh, thereby prevent us from starting from scratch a very expensive job. Now, one concern uh, here is that we are running this MapReduce job that is writing to solar while the live updates are also coming to solar. Now, this can often create a race condition. The race condition can be pretty bad in this case uh, because it would mean that the MapReduce job can sometimes write a stale value to overwrite a more recent update. And as a result, the most recent update would be lost and the user will get stale results when they search. And to prevent this from happening, we use Solar in optimistic concurrency mode when we are running the MapReduce job. Uh, now, optimistic concurrency is something that Solar uh, provides out of the box if you uh, use the doc-based version constraint processor factory in the update processor chain in the Solar schema. What it tells Solar is uh, to use a specific field called concurrency timestamp in this case, 
uh, but you can use any field of your choice um, to resolve conflicts when uh, there is an existing document in the index and an update comes in. Uh, it, in this case, what it does is it uses the value of the concurrency timestamp. And if the incoming updates timestamp is lower than the one that is already in the index, then Solar will reject that update. And in this way, we are able to protect uh, getting um, stale updates overriding more recent updates. If you want to learn more about optimistic concurrency in Solar, I suggest reading this blog from Yonic. Uh, I found it pretty helpful. Uh, it goes into more detail about how optimistic concurrency works under the hood and various other ways that you can do optimistic concurrency uh, other than using doc-based version constraint process factory. Now, there is also a downside to using optimistic concurrency. Uh, when you use this mode, Solar must go through all the segment files in the index to ensure that there is uh, no document version with a more latest timestamp. And this is pretty expensive, which results in higher latencies for updates to Solar. Uh, this also causes our rebuild index job to run slower than usual. The other problem that this may cause uh, happens if you enable this for deletes. If optimistic concurrency is used for deletes, Solar will pres preserve the deleted document to store the concurrency timestamp so that it can resolve conflicts for out-of-order updates. Now, what this can mean is if you have a very high number of deletes on your index, these documents can count against the total number of documents in Solar. Now, Lucene has a max value of documents that you can store, and I think it is something around 2.4 billion, which is a pretty high number. But if your index is at the scale of ours, then you could encounter this problem like we did. And at that point, the index becomes completely unusable, and you must re-index from scratch or run a very expensive optimized index job to get rid of the tombstones. Uh, some of the other pain points of uh, the infrastructure I just talked about uh, were that uh, we were updating Solar and the offline store asynchronously, uh, and uh, as a result, it dripped between the two sources. Uh, at a certain point, we measured this drift to be about, around 6%, which means that um, when we rebuilt the Solar cluster from source, 6% uh, of documents could potentially be missing from the cluster. And uh, this can cause pretty bad experience for users. The other problem is that the search worker is writing to all the replicas uh, for that particular document or all the replica shards that are active. And it is also writing to the offline store, which means there's pretty large fan out of updates in search worker. As a result, if there is even a small spike in updates, it causes a pretty large magnification in the search worker and uh, it increases the load. As the load increases, uh, the writes may start to fail due to resource constraints on search worker. These write failures cause retries, and the retries further exacerbate the problem due to fan out. As a result, uh, we often see search worker getting overwhelmed pretty easily, and that is not good for an indexing pipeline that is running at the scale that we do. Lastly, as the data is growing, we must continue to scale our edge-based clusters to ensure that uh, we are able to complete the rebuild index job within a certain SLA. Now, uh, at, at the point that I was uh, looking into this, the cost of continuing to scale the edge-based cl clusters was becoming cost prohibitive for various reasons. And that is when we started thinking about uh, moving some of our infrastructure to the cloud. Now, moving to the cloud uh, poses the obvious benefit of reducing hardware costs because you can right-size your clusters, you can auto-scale, you can choose different hardware SKUs that are better suited for your needs as your needs change, uh, rather than having to buy expensive machines, rack them in uh, data centers, and then have uh, the additional overhead of maintaining them, which brings us to operational overhead. Uh, when we were using EdgeBase, we had an entire ops team that was responsible for uh, patching those clusters, uh, maintaining uh, those clusters at scale, ensuring that the uh, uh, cloud error version that we are running on that cluster is the latest one, uh, 
um, security patches, so on and so forth. And this is a pretty large overhead. And as the cluster grows, it becomes even harder to maintain it. Uh, this is something that can be uh, handed off to a public cloud if you are using cloud infrastructure. And lastly, uh, moving to cloud infrastructure opens new doors for improving scalability, as we are going to see in the rest of my presentation. So now that we understand uh, why or some of the motivations for moving to the public cloud, let's look at how the infrastructure looks after uh, moving to GCP. So what we have currently is a hybrid architecture, which is some of the components are still running uh, on-prem, while some are in GCP. The ones that are in GCP are Bigtable. Uh, the reason for using Bigtable is uh, that HBase is basically uh, implementation of the original Google Bigtable paper. So they are functionally the same, uh, but Bigtable does have some additional benefits uh, that we are going to talk about later. Uh, Dataproc is another offering by GCP uh, that allows us to run uh, Spark jobs and MapReduce jobs against data on Bigtable. PubSub is a Kafka-like uh, pub published subscribe system, and we are going to see how uh, we are using that in our indexing pipeline to improve scalability. And lastly, uh, Cloud KMS is a key management system that enables us to encrypt the data in Bigtable at rest to ensure data security. The components that remain still on-prem are Solar and Search Worker and the Query Service, which are um, both running on Kubernetes on-prem. Now, the key to maintaining a hybrid infrastructure is that we should be able to securely communicate and send data across the network between box data centers and GCP to ensure we maintain compliance with all um, uh, the policies like um, FedRAMP, uh, GDPR, CCPA uh, that our customers require us to be adherent to. Uh, to be able to process data in public cloud, uh, we had to build a private network interconnect to ensure that the data goes does not go over the public internet. In addition, we also uh, have each service talk to Bigtable using a uh, um, service account key. The service account key authenticates only uh, authorized services uh, to ac access the data, and this data this key is stored in Vault. Uh, the services also uh, talk to GCP over a web proxy. This ensures that only the web proxy can access GCP and hence any other service is not able to accidentally access the resources inside a Google Cloud Platform. In addition, uh, we built a shared VPC around uh, the box data centers and GCP. This ensures that we can use private IP addresses in the box data center and they are discoverable and accessible from GCP. This is critical for data proc nodes in GCP to be able to index to solar clusters on-prem. And finally, we have Calico rules that prevent services uh, from accessing the web proxy that are not authorized to talk to GCP and firewall rules on the GCP side that ensure that only data proc nodes within the search project can access the solo cluster. This overall ensures that we have secure connectivity between uh, the on-prem systems and Google Cloud Platform. Secondly, we must ensure that the data is stored in a secure way in the cloud and processed securely. To do this, when we store the data in Bigtable, we encrypt the data um, using a data encryption key. Uh, the data encryption key is generated randomly for each row and encrypted and stored along with the row. The data encryption key is itself encrypted using a key encryption key that is randomly selected from a key encryption key bundle. The key encryption key bundle itself is then encrypted using cloud key management system and stored in GCS. What this ensures is that we can easily rotate the key in Cloud KMS, which then changes the encryption of the KEC, uh, and we don't have to do the expensive operation of re-encrypting our data encryption keys in Bigtable very often. This enables us to process the data securely and, and adhere to compliance requirements for our customers to process the data in public cloud. This is how the indexing pipeline now looks like in GCP. The initial part continues to be the same. Uh, the search worker, instead of writing directly to Solar, now first writes to Bigtable. 
the big table instance is uh, deployed as a uh, uh, two clusters which are in different uh, Google regions to ensure high uh, DR, DR and HA. Internally, the data is replicated by Bigtable from the active node to the DR node. Search worker writes to the active node, and once the write is successful, it writes an event to PubSub. Uh, now, PubSub, as I mentioned, is a Kafka-like publish subscribe system uh, which has topics. We created a uh, topic per shard of the solar cluster. And search worker, once it determines the correct shard, it writes to uh, that particular topic. Uh, and then every replica has its own consumer, which has to subscribe to that topic. The index writer for that replica then receives the event, reads the solar document XML from Bigtable, and writes it to solar. In this way, we are able to ensure that there is no drift between Bigtable and Solar like we had between HBase and Solar because we are reading the data from Bigtable before writing to Solar. To rebuild our indexes, we run the MapReduce job using Cloud Dataproc. To do this, we orchestrate the job through Airflow and use a data platform service to create the cluster and submit the job. The actual binary for the job is deployed from Artifactory via Jenkins into a GCS bucket, which is accessible by Dataproc. Dataproc then runs a MapReduce scan on the Bigtable cluster and writes the index to Solar. Obviously, it also talks to Cloud Camus to be able to decrypt the content in memory and write it in a secure way. Now, some of the benefits that we saw instantly from moving to Bigtable and Dataproc were auto-scaling. Both Bigtable and Dataproc support auto-scaling, which is based on the load, it will increase the number of nodes to handle that load. And then as that load goes away, it will scale down. This ensures that we don't need to run a large beefy cluster all the time. We can auto-scale up during peak times or when we are running expensive jobs and then scale down, for example, during weekends when the traffic is slow. Bigtable also supports dynamic load balancing. What this means is if there is an uptick in updates from a specific enterprise, which is causing hotspotting on a particular node in Bigtable, it will split that node's data and distribute it across multiple nodes to distribute the hotspot. Now, this is something unique to Bigtable that we didn't have on Edgebase, and uh, this benefit enables us to handle uh, spikes from specific enterprises, especially when they are migrating data into Box uh, in a more seamless way. Bigtable also supports automatic failover. What this means is if you are running two nodes, uh, two uh, instances of Bigtable, an active and a DR, it will automatically failover traffic in case of a DR event from the active instance to the passive one. This ensures that there is no manual human intervention required for this and reduces the mean time to recovery for DR events. And lastly, the data proc clusters are ephemeral, which means that we only need to create the cluster and run it while the job is running and then tear down the cluster. This enables us to save a lot of cost um, compared to running an expensive edge-based cluster all the time. So now that we understand uh, how the infrastructure looks like, uh, let's look at how we performed a migration of um, over 200 terabytes of data from on-prem into GCP with zero downtime and zero data loss. To begin with, uh, we forked the writes, uh, that is we ran dual writes from the search worker to HBase and Bigtable once we deployed Bigtable clusters in a replicated mode. Once the live writes were working, we started running incremental MapReduce jobs from HBase to migrate the data. The MapReduce job itself was a uh, modification of the real index job. We were able to reuse that code by simply changing the uh, client that was writing to Solar with uh, a client that writes to Bigtable. And we were able to reuse all the functionality around dead lettering and uh, checkpoint. Once the incremental job started running, we also ran validations to ensure parity between HBase and Bigtable. This is important to ensure that there is no data loss between the two systems, and uh, we have migrated all the data successfully. Now, when you're migrating uh, 200 terabytes of data, you cannot do it 
uh, at one shot. First of all, the job would be ex- extremely long running, excuse me, and uh, it would um, be very hard to validate um, issues. So we did this incrementally with continuous validation. What this meant is we would migrate chunks of data, uh, randomly sample rows, validate them using hashes, and then analyze the results. If we found any discrepancies, fix them, and then migrate the next chunk. Some of the validations that we run were uh, continuous live write validation. So a percentage of the live writes from the uh, search worker were continuously being validated to ensure the same rows were present in HBase and Bigtable. We ran weekly scheduled jobs to validate the data across the two uh, targets. And then lastly, whenever we ran a post uh, migration job, we would run a post migration validation to sample 1% of the rows and ensure that they matched across the two clusters. This ensured that we had a pretty high confidence when we were uh, completing the migration that we have successfully migrated all of the data into Bigtable. Once the Bigtable data was migrated, uh, we had to migrate the solar clusters to ensure that they were rebuilt against the Bigtable data to reduce or get rid of the drift that I talked about earlier. We also had to migrate to the new pipeline using PubSub. So to do this, we enabled the live writes to PubSub from Search Worker and then rebuilt the solar clusters against the Bigtable data using the rebuild index job. Once the rebuild completed, we replayed or enable the consumer to consume the writes from PubSub. Now, you may notice that we no longer re- need to run uh, Solar in the optimistic concurrency mode. This is because uh, we are using PubSub, which can store uh, the backlog of updates while the rebuild job is running. And then once we enable the consumer for the shard, it will consume the backlog. And hence, there wouldn't be any need for resolving race conditions when re- writing to solar. Uh, This enabled us to reduce the rebuild time for solar indexes drastically. Now, obviously, there were some challenges uh, to performing this kind of a migration. The first one was building the secure network. Uh, We had to work with uh, Google network engineering and hardware engineering to set up this private network interconnect and the shared VPCs Uh, ensure that we are sharing keys in the correct way, we are encrypting the data and uh, talking to GCP over MKLS to ensure that uh, the network is secure and we are not somehow exposing our customer data to the public internet. Secondly, we had to maintain cross-compatibility between uh, Bigtable and edge-based libraries since we were doing uh, dual writes. Now, because of various gRPC libraries that are used both by HBase and Bigtable, it can sometimes be challenging if you're running uh, a version of HBase client that is incompatible with the Bigtable client. Um, we also ran into some eventual consistency issues uh, during validation, which was showing pretty high um, validation failures. Now, this was happening because Bigtable continuously uh, fails or um, uh, moves writes that are experiencing high latency from the primary cluster to the DR cluster. What this could lead to is that the write goes to the primary cluster, but the validation read goes to the passive cluster. Now, due to replication latency, you encounter an eventual consistency issue. The cover had to retry our validations repeatedly by injecting um, delays and wait for eventual eventual consistency to recover. And once we did this, we saw our parity improve uh, dramatically. And lastly, there is just overhead of running in this hybrid state where you have both HBase and Bigtable. You have clusters, uh, solar clusters that are built against HBase and some that are built against Bigtable. And uh, to ensure that we are running in a secure way, we need to um, be always aware of this hybrid state, which can be significant overhead for on-call and also for other projects or development that is happening on your team. So these are some challenges to be mindful of when you are performing a similar migration, uh, which can force you to run in this kind of a hybrid state for some time. Now, the benefits. We uh, were able to save over a million dollars in HBase hardware cost because we no longer needed to run a pretty large HBase cluster. Uh, we also didn't need to uh, pay 
the cost of uh, data centers. Uh, and then we were able to right size our big table cluster because uh, the rebuild index job was actually running on data proc. So we were able to scale these two separately. Uh, and this resulted in a pretty large cost saving. Uh, we were able to improve uh, the scalability of the indexing pipeline, as we saw by introducing uh, PubSub, which meant that the search worker fan out problem uh, got reduced. We no longer read it to, needed to write to five different replicas. We just wrote to a single uh, topic, and then the consumers consumed, uh, subscribed to that topic and uh, took care of writing to the replicas. We also established Bigtable as a single source of truth. Uh, earlier, we had the problem that the sources were out of sync, and as a result, we couldn't trust the data in edge base. But because of the way we modified our indexing pipeline in GCP, we are able to ensure that Bigtable actually has the same data that is existent in Solar. And lastly, we were able to reduce our index rebuild time dramatically because uh, we were able to stop using optimistic concurrency during the rebuild job. This meant our uh, mean time to recovery for issues on the solar cluster also reduced. Uh, and uh, in general, cluster rebuild time was reduced drastically, which also impacted cost because we the, the lesser time it takes to run the job, it's uh, lesser time that you're running the data proc cluster and hence paying lesser money to Google. So, oh, that brings me to the end of my uh, discussion today around indexing pipelines. Some of the other things my team is working on is actually now moving solar into Google Kubernetes so that we have the entire uh, system running in um, GCP. And on top of that, we are building a search platform to abstract away the complexity of running a search infrastructure so that we can onboard more tenants for other use cases such as user search and admin search. And they do not have to interact with the complexity of running solar or running a expensive, uh, running a scalable indexing pipeline. That's all I had today. I'm open to any questions that you have now. Uh, also, if you're interested in working on problems like the ones that I talked about, my team is hiring both in US and Poland, so you can reach out to me over LinkedIn and we can chat more. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? No? I'm looking in the chat. So far, no question in the chat. So I would say then we we finish here, right? Yeah, I think it's very late and people want to break out all the beer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Shubro. Roy, give a warm applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.